Welcome back to another episode of the Suits in the Stadium podcast. I am your host, Casey Coleman. Joining me on this week's episode is Natalie Smith. Natalie is currently an associate professor of rec and sports management at East Tennessee State University. Really enjoyed my conversation with Natalie. I think one of the biggest things that stuck out was when I asked her the question about to what or to whom would she credit her longevity in sports. And she shared the story about how she went into an interview and she had put on her resume that she had been the mascot before. And for some reason that stuck out to the individual that was interviewing her and eventually brought her onto that team and hired her for that position. And I think the thing that stuck out for me in that was the idea of when getting into sports, especially if you're brand new, you got to be willing to do anything and everything that you're asked of. It may not be glamorous. It may not be exciting. It may not be that dream role that you're looking for, but you may need to be willing to be the mascot. You may need to be willing to stuff envelopes or stuff press releases or run copies or, you know, tech support on the printers and computers. I don't know. So many different things out there in sports to do, but you've got to be willing to do whatever it takes to get in the door. And you never know when that thing specifically, in Natalie's case, it was being the mascot, will catch the eye of a future employer. And maybe that's the thing that pushes you over the edge if there's maybe other people that are battling for that position. So really enjoyed my conversation. Hope you enjoy my conversation with Natalie Smith. Folks, please tell me welcome in this week's guest, Natalie Smith. Natalie has previously worked for a few different organizations, including Women's Sports Foundation, Major League Soccer, and the University of Illinois. Natalie is currently the Associate Professor of Sports and Rec Management at East Tennessee State University. Natalie, how are you today? I'm fantastic. Go Bucks. <laughs> Love it. Go Bucks. Uh, Natalie, appreciate you being a part of the podcast. A great connection from a mutual friend of ours, Alondra Hernandez. Appreciate you jumping on the podcast. Yeah. Happy to be here. Love talking sports. Love it, love imagine. it. Well, we'll jump right in. Uh, first question, what pivotal experiences in your education or early career helped you realize that the sports management industry was the right path for you? Um, I'm going to start with a straight up sob story. It's great. <laughs> We're going to just really positive. Um, when I was in college, I went to college at a small school uh, in Los Angeles County, I should say. Um, and I got cut my junior year from my college soccer team and that like that was my sport like I also swim but like soccer was my sport okay. and my coach made the right choice like honestly like I was not good enough <laughs> to be on that team and she was like I would love for you to be on my staff and uh -huh. I at first was like no like I'm not gonna like be your glorified water girl <laughs> and uh it was through kind of a conversation with uh my who was my teammate at the time um that it was kind of like, no, actually, I still want to be involved. And I think this is something that is a really great way to stay involved. And uh, that, that's when I realized that actually, um, I really, I really prefer everything that happens outside of what happens on the okay. field. I love watching it. I loved <laughs> playing it. But in reality, I was like, no, I think I really enjoy all these other things um, about it. And so that was a really uh, cool moment where it took something that was pretty rough into something where I was like, oh, I think this what I might want to do for my life. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, in the ever evolving world of sport management, how do you stay updated and continue to learn beyond formal education? Are there any ongoing educational experiences or resources you recommend? Yeah, so I'm always learning. Like that is something that I think people kind of assume they're professors or, oh, just there's some sort of cap on the knowledge that we have, but sure. Um, <laughs> No, it's one thing I do is I read, like I read the women's sports business newsletter. Um, I follow people in my field on social media and it's kind of knowing what your field is because sport is so large. Sure. Um, so I follow a lot of people specifically in women's sports, but also on kind of usually the marketing side of things um, and then the innovation and creativity because that's my area of research. And then I love to talk to people. So every time I go, for me, it's women's soccer specifically, but whenever I go to a vet, I reach out to friends, old friends, new friends, just anyone I have, might happen to know. And I 
pepper them with questions. <laughs> like, I'm like, hey, how's your family? But also, so what's new, like in the <laughs> industry? Um, and they know it. Like, they they absolutely know that that yeah. is something I'm going to, like, casually <laughs> try to bring into the conversation. Um and so I was just at the Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. And yeah, it was like every day I was like, so, what, you know, what's, 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 what are you struggling with? What's, you know, because the good stuff is always going to go public, right? Sure, it's always sure. going to be out there. That's great. Like I can follow every innovation, every creative idea that is successful, but I want to know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, sure. And that's when talking to people is like really, really helpful. Um, plus like, it's, you know, they're old friends. So I generally like them as people. So that's always helpful. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And we'll, we'll get into a little bit more on the networking piece in a little bit. Uh, but next question I, I personally put in because it first relates to me and sure, I'm sure it relates to other people as well in the sports space. Uh, what advice would you give to individuals who are considering a career in sports, but it may not have traditional sports related education or work experience? How can they leverage their existing skills and knowledge to break into the industry? I think the industry is more open to that than ever. I mean, I definitely would say that there's still some bias toward just, oh, you played at a high level or, you know, <laughs> then yes, you would be great at this. I mean, I remember I had a boss sure. that came straight from a prestigious university um, <laughs> with, I think, zero work experience, except okay. for had happened to play soccer for that prestigious in university. <laughs> um, I don't think that would happen today. Like it, okay. and to be fair, I mean, they perhaps were hired on potential because they ended up being an amazing, like they are crushing it in their career, but I don't think that would happen today. Whereas I'm seeing, I was just talking to like a new connection of mine who uh, works at FIFA and she had worked in like corporate, um, you know, one of the agencies, right. And not sport related at all. And it was really interesting to, to hear her kind of talk about how they really appreciated because most sport organizations are quite small. And so I think they're starting to understand that if you have somebody who worked at, you know, Deloitte or one of those really large, large companies, they have expertise in, software management or whatever it is that yeah. you just don't have when you work for a small organization. Sure. Um, so trying to get, understand what are the pain points of an organization and seeing where your expertise fits into that. Love so it. is it, is it technology? Is it, um, you know, m you know, related to operations management? Is it related to, I don't know, systems thinking like that there are, and I think you see it more and more sport organizations, they're partnering with those external organizations now too. Sure. Um, so then I've, I remember somebody who worked at Allstate um, and they, they wanted to get in the sports space, but they like worked for all, but Wall State sponsors, I don't know how many, or, how many sport organizations. Right. So they just sort of wiggled <laughs> their way across Allstate. Yeah. Um, and got into the Allstate uh -huh. side of okay. the sports space. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic answer for sure. Uh, we definitely all have those things that we excelled in maybe outside of sports before we made that transition. Uh, so finding where that fits. Uh, next question. I apologize in advance. I didn't include this in the questions I sent you, uh, but it just came to mind. So as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, you started, we, you worked in major league soccer. You worked for some of these different organizations. Then you transitioned into teaching first at University of Illinois, now at East Tennessee State. Uh, just curious what led you from working in the sports world to becoming a professor and really desiring to invest uh, in the future of sports management? Yeah, I think it was, um, I wasn't terribly good at my job. Um, <laughs> You talk to any of my friends at uh, the various sport organizations I worked at. I tried really hard. I worked really, really hard. Yeah. Um, and I think that is an interesting lesson for people to understand is you also, you can work so, so hard, but, um, and you can get to a certain level. Um, I mean, certainly, right. I had full-time gigs in professional sport organizations, yeah. um, but that never, there was always this mismatch. I was okay. always working really, really hard and not really getting as far as I wanted to get. Um, and so it was that moment, the reason 
that I went into decided to get a PhD and um, go into academia is uh, I realized that um, the fit was right. And so my skill set, what I loved to do when I worked at soccer, I marketed major league soccer, my favorite things in that job actually correlated really well with being a professor. It was, okay. I loved doing the research. Like I love Googling. I mean, obviously my research now is a little more complicated than that, but <laughs> yeah. um, back in the day, that's, that's, I was part of my job was to Google for information. Um, sure. And then I love mentoring. Like okay. I love mentoring the interns um, and, you know, and then I coached as well for a living for a little while and coaching and teaching are very, very similar. Yeah. Um, it's just, I don't have to work on the weekends. Um, that's the real <laughs> difference between coaching and teaching. So I think that's what it was, is I realized that, oh, wow, all my favorite parts of the job, because as soon as you love it, like love it, love it, then all that hard work, it's not as hard. Like it's just sure. the energy side. Sure. Yeah. Love it. Uh, you've worked approximately 16 years so far in the sport management field. To what or to whom would you credit your longevity so far in the sports world? Um, also I didn't realize that's how long it's <laughs> technically my first job was I was 16 and I was like, I was a soccer coach. So really it's been 20, 23 right. years, <laughs> which makes me feel so old. <laughs> um, I would say it, one of it was stubbornness, just this, uh, continual eagerness to reach out to people, to get out of my comfort zone, you know, um, when I was in undergrad, it, you know, I talked to our, you know, I was at a D3 school and I knew that I needed more experience and different experience. And uh, my coach's office mate had a friend who was the AD at Cal State Fullerton. And so just that idea of, hey, do you want to go talk to this guy? Yes, I do. Turns out my talking to this guy was actually a job interview. Someone really, there was some miscommunication <laughs> there. Uh, he loved the fact that I had dressed up as a mascot, like, but I think that's the thing. It's that sort of game for Wait, things. for your meeting, you dressed up as a mascot? No, 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 no. Sorry. <laughs> so, so I had worked for a soccer team the year before okay. and part on my resume, I had Got listed it. Got like, it. Okay. like mascot as one of the things that I did for them. Okay. Um, and he thought that, I think that it was, it was sort of an example of something where it's like, I'm, I'm going to come in and just yeah. do what I need to do. And like, Absolutely. I'm game for things. And so I think that's what it is. It's like going in and be like, yeah, sure. Why not? That's, and I think that's why I research innovation and creativity is because it's, it's such an ethos of like, yeah, I'm game for it. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's how I ended up still in it after all these years. Fantastic. Fantastic. Sorry. I missed that. I thought you went into the interview as a mascot. I, that would be amazing. I'm going to change the story now. I'm just going to tell people that's what happened. That guy's long you, gone. So you said you didn't know it was an interview. So I thought maybe you just showed up casual and you're like, just I'm... showed up as the Charlotte Eagle. That's the there you go. But yeah, I think like you said, uh, it showed that you're willing to do anything, whether it's be mascot, whether it's sell tickets, whether it's do whatever, like you were game for whatever it took for yeah. sure. Uh, transition to the advice portion of our conversation. What are the key skills or qualities that you believe aspiring sport management professionals should focus on developing to stand out in a market that, as I'm learning right now, is uber competitive? So competitive. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, one is figure out the issues that are happening in sports right now and and is there ways that you can help solve those problems? Um, because I think that is really interesting because you're helping make someone else's life better. Um, and so they're going to be really excited to have someone who makes their life better um, yeah. or the organization better. Right. But it's like most likely the person would be excited about you making the organization better. Um, I think another thing is effective communication um, because we talk a lot about communication and I, I harbor my students a lot about this is we're like, we need good leadership. We need good communication. And I'm like, yeah. if anyone's ever been in a, a long-term relationship, you know that the the phrase good <laughs> communication is incredibly complex. Sure. Um, and so how do you practice those skills um, and be able to effectively communicate with people so that they understand what skills you bring to the table? 
Sure. Because you may have, you may be the most talented um, in the game, but if you don't have the skills to be able to communicate that, then, I mean, there's, I think about like saber metrics, right? Which is like the most overused example of innovation in sports, but <laughs> it existed long before it was ever really used in the sport. Yeah. And it's because it wasn't, it, like, they didn't invent it in the Oakland A's. They just used it. Sure. And so it's that idea of how are you communicating that value add to an organization? Um, I think something too is like, we, I think, I think, and I see it in my students, so they focus too much on name recognition. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, yeah, it's great to work at national level organizations. Like, yeah, yeah. I, right. Major league soccer, people know what that is more now than they did when I worked Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but it that's not where it started. It started at Pomona Pitzer Athletics Division Three. It started at, you know, um San Dimas High School, where I was the JV soccer coach. Um <laughs> and and I have students who here, um, we're right beside Bristol Moore Speedway, which is the tenth largest sport facility in the world, which okay. I did not know and I did some Googling. And like I, I don't know anything about nascar or i didn't sure. when i first got here yeah. um and my students not a lot of my students are big into nascar but it's you have access to a large sport organization that has sure. had to innovate because of the changing nature of that sport that it's like those are the people you want to work for yeah. and so yeah and they're excited because yeah not too many young people are like gunning to work at a facility in rural Tennessee. Yeah. And yet the alum from that program, I mean, from those, from that uh, organization, because they hire a lot of like part-time for our students okay. in like seasonal work, yeah. they get that experience. Well, that's, what's the difference between Bristol Motor Speedway and Dallas Cowboys Stadium? Nothing. There's no difference. I mean, Dallas Cowboys fame is fancier, but sure. that's, there's no difference. So, right work for get those experiences work for those places that may seem a little unusual or maybe don't have name recognition right and you know that you can then parlay into you know something that you actually something larger i guess yeah yeah they're both the same stepping stone uh one may look sexier on your resume than the other uh, and it's, but i definitely hear you it's about those mentors, which I mean, I know that's a question, so I won't get into that, but you're ahead of me. You're ahead of me. Uh, next question. The sports industry is known for its high pressure moments. How do you personally maintain composure and make strategic decisions during intense situations? This question. I love this question so much because I would say I did it. <laughs> I, Fair answer. I, uh, in high pressure situations, um, I mean, I remember there. I remember our first opening game for Sky Blue, which is now Gotham. Uh, I remember our first game, and and I remember it in the sense that I don't remember any of it. Like I <laughs> have zero memory from that day. Um, I have photos, so I'm glad that somebody took <laughs> evidence that I worked for 14 hours. Um, yeah. But I, it's funny because I loved the, I loved so many things about game day and that high pressure situation, but as much as I loved it, my skill set is much more in the preparation. Got it. Um, and so it's kind of nice because now I don't really have any high pressure situations um, <laughs> in the nature that I'm in. And I think that's good for everybody. Um, I don't think that I'm a, I'm a good crisis uh, person. And so that is something also for people to think about, right? Like yeah. if you're really good in a crisis, get into game day ops. Get into yeah. <laughs> PR, get into those. If you're not, get into analytics, get into, yeah. um, you know, I just think about there's so many other business, uh, business development, right? Business development, it's very methodical in what they do. It's very personable. It's very, but they don't really have a lot of crises the way some of these other, sure. um, these other fields do within the sport. Yeah. That's, yeah. That was, a, that was my favorite. I was like, oh no, I, I, I threw, I remember when I worked at Cal State Fullerton, their baseball team's really good. And so we had like three or 4,000 fans every game. And 
you know, long hours, high pressure. And I threw Klondike bars out into the crowd whenever we got a certain amount of strikeouts. <laughs> the amount of times I threw it in th into the wrong section. Um, <laughs> yeah, because it's in a high pressure situation. I make a ton of mistakes, <laughs> which is why everyone's happy that I no longer work game day operations. Hey, it's all right. You you found your role. It wasn't in a high pressure spot. Works for some, doesn't work for others. Uh, next nope. question, and we, we touched on this a little bit, uh, just talking about your your transition into the uh, professor space, just how much you enjoy being a mentor. Uh, but just curious if you had any mentors yourself during your journey that you were able to lean on when you needed to, and how would you say they best helped you? Uh, yeah, so many amazing um most people are not very good at being mentors um because it's not a skill that you really either you you either didn't learn it or you don't really take the time to develop it um sure. it's really a passion for people um and so finding those people that are really passionate about it um yeah. so you know my college coach in the coaching realm you know, I mean, she didn't really know a lot about the business side of it, but she knew a ton about coaching and she was an amazing mentor. Um, and also just asking questions, like a really good mentor will just ask you questions because sure. it's not about them telling you their specific, I mean, yeah, sure. You can learn their life journey, but they also, also ask you a lot of questions because that will help them understand, you know, what your dreams and hopes and skills are. And so in places where I didn't get great mentorship, um, I really enjoyed peer mentorship. And that's, you know, I still have coworkers that I've had, you know, that I've back from back in the day, um, as you say, but because <laughs> I'm old now, um, I still stay in touch with them because there is a certain amount of, wow, you were so helpful in giving me advice when, you know, you let me bounce off this idea, you let me bounce off this problem, you know, that sort of gratitude for those people. Um, and then sometimes it's funny, like you'll, uh, my master's group degree, uh, one of my advisors for our like group thesis, uh, she at my graduation was, was talking to me and my parents and she said, you know, Natalie, you should, you should get a PhD. And I laughed. I kind of like straight up laughed out loud. <laughs> um, and so sometimes your mentors are going to mentor you that you're not ready to hear it. Um, it was like, yeah. no, I'm going to go work. I'm going to go work in major league soccer. And then I'm going to go work in at the FIFA world cup. And um, I had all these big dreams and plans. And it, I think cause she saw something. Yeah. She saw it wasn't just cause I always, I knew I was smart enough. I mean, anybody's smart enough to get a PhD. Um, but it was, she saw that this would be a good fit. Um, yeah. and that I wasn't quite ready to hear. Um, so sometimes you might have a mentor that you realize they were right all along. Yeah. And I think it's great insight. Like you said, sometimes they see things, uh, for us that we may not be able to see yet. And as you said, then we come back around and we're like, Hey, remember that one time you said that you were right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sticking on the relationships piece and the friendships piece. We also hit on this earlier as well, uh, but networking plays a crucial role in many industries. How can individuals new to the field effectively build a strong network uh, in the sport management sector? I think one is, is, uh, and this happens a lot uh, with nobody wants to network with me, but a lot of my friends um, <laughs> get networked, shall we say, um, is that it's this sort of like, what can you do for me? Like what yeah. knowledge can I take from you? Um, it's the people that have genuine curiosity. Yep. And that you, I mean, that's where it can really make a difference. Uh, you want to network is it's like, I'm not trying to get anything out of you. I just have questions. And if you have 20 minutes, I would just love to ask you these like three questions. Yep. Um, and it's that, it's that doing that homework. I mean, I have, it's, you know, I've had friends who said, yeah, somebody asked me how, you know, how much like our expansion bids cost. That's on Google. Do the Googling, like, <laughs> like stock the crap out of people in a yeah. completely healthy and uh, normal way, but like <laughs> do the work. 
and then ask questions. Sure. Um, and yeah. And if you, it's somebody that's like trying to break into the industry um, or trying to figure out maybe what their next step would be is um, one, don't be afraid that ever, like half people are going to ignore you. They're just busy. It's not personal. Yeah. Um, but then the ones who do reach out, it's it understand you're taking their time. Um, ask thorough, good questions. Um, yeah. And most especially like people who are, you know, genuine and curious and uh, people want them to succeed. You know, yeah. I've seen that. I have a student of mine who was kind of a little bit of a late bloomer and, and something clicked for him a little bit, like probably junior or senior year. He went and volunteered at a couple of different like weekend events. And I think yeah. that's a great way to network is Absolutely. just go volunteer at something for a weekend. It's not going to take that much time or energy or, I mean, I did that when I was uh, at Sky Blue. I went and volunteered at a Washington Spirit thing because the person who ran that um, is like one of the most well-known operations people in all of women's soccer. So I was like, I want to hang out with her, I guess. <laughs> um, but so taking those moments and then you, you know, they see you're putting in the work, you're genuine, you ask good, you know, curious questions. Yeah. They're going to want you to succeed and they're going to help. Yeah. And that's what happened. He had... He met some people down there. They were like, oh, you've got to meet my friend over here. You've got to. And, um, and he was so surprised. I think it was, just, yeah, he was surprised at how much people did want to help because that people makes people feel good. Um, yeah. That they're like, oh yeah, look at that. that. That seems like a good person. I want to yeah. help that good person. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that you brought up the word genuine. Uh, it's definitely a, a term that, that gets connected a lot uh, when I ask this question, because there are two sides, right? There's the person that's solely seeking for themselves, who knows who I applied for this job, who can put in a good word for me. And then, as you mentioned, there's that genuine curiosity, that genuine care of, you know, maybe eventually there is something where you help me with that. But like, I want to get to know what you're doing. I want to get to know about your skills. Like you mentioned for you, you volunteered at this event because you had a genuine curiosity to get to know this person and to see how they did it. Uh, so I think that genuine piece, especially in networking, is very important for sure. She she like threw me into things that I was so unprepared for, but I think she knew that it was one of the things I lacked was confidence. So just building yeah. the like, here, no, you try this and you can do it, um, which I really really appreciated at the time. And uh, anyone's really curious about like networking, Adam Grant uh, is a professor. I think he's at Wharton, maybe I don't remember what university, but. Um, I follow him on Twitter. Uh, his, <laughs> he, he has done a lot of this research, but he also like relays a lot of information, um, on his social media about like networking and about org behavior and those kind of things, um, that I always find to be really, really useful. Um, because at the end of the day, like you want to network, but you also want people to talk about you. Yep. Right. You want people to be talking about you in rooms that you're not in absolutely positively yeah absolutely <laughs> positively for sure positively <laughs> uh next question there's not a right answer to this question still looking for the right answer but what is the key to maintaining a good work-life balance how do you not get overwhelmed with your career and still make time for your family and friends and things you enjoy doing outside of work it is you're Every person is different. Absolutely. I mean, that's it's finding the right fit of a job because you're sure. not going to go home exhausted every day. So, um, you know, I have I, it's funny. I just went back to New York and saw a friend of mine I used to work with at Major League Soccer. And, you know, with her personality and like she New York City is a perfect fit for her in terms of living there. Like, she, yeah. you know what I mean? It just I can just see it. It's this vibrancy. Um, whereas. I love a good mountain. Like you don't, right? And <laughs> so the only place I could ever work actually was probably a college because yeah. I don't want to live in a big city. Yeah. So it's understanding kind of yourself as well and figuring out because it work life balance isn't so much about time as it is about energy. 
And yeah. how much energy do you have? How much energy does it take to do things? Right. Um, understanding what is a life giver and what is a life taker, knowing that that's going to ebb and flow and, um, and recognizing that your career is going to uh, ebb and flow based off of, I mean, I've got friends here, you know, two small kids, like their career is in a very different place right now, but right. they knew that. Right. And that they're yeah. willing to kind of make those sacrifices. And it's once you, tr once you try to make it all fit into some sort of magical puzzle, then that's like, you're mm. actually spending more energy on that than you are sure. just accepting that like your life is going to be utter chaos. Cause you have, mm. you know, three kids in elementary school. <laughs> Yeah. While working in sports, which is not a nine to five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah great thoughts there for sure. Uh, bringing it home. Final few questions, switching to some more fun, lighthearted questions, except for this first one is not lighthearted, but we'll roll with it. Uh, what is the most heartwarming or memorable sports moment you witnessed or experienced? Maybe something we as the casual fan would never see on TV, but you had the chance to witness or experience. So I went with memorable rather than heartwarming on this one uh -huh. um, because this one just cracks me up. So MLS is 50% is owned by Soccer United Marketing. So I also worked at Soccer United Marketing um, okay. and they own the rights to the Gold Cup, CONCACAF Gold Cup. I'm not actually sure if they do anymore, um, but I worked a Gold Cup game at Red Bull Arena in, you know, in New Jersey. And um, I was in charge of like shepherding the, Photo, like the photographers behind the um goal uh, yeah. which is hilarious because i actually don't really watch men's soccer and so i think some of my mm. some of my friends were like oh, that's amazing you're on the field like guatemala honduras i'm like cool i don't what um <laughs> i like to, i like i understand soccer um, yeah. but i don't actually care um that this i'm head, i'm watching like one of the greatest rivalries of like all time um <laughs> But what was the best part was somebody got called for a penalty. And as you can imagine, I mean, the stadium is full and it is yeah. boisterous. It is loud. The, it happened to be a penalty in like the, the opposing nation's fan base, like okay. behind them. Yeah. Um, and they lost their minds. They were throwing. So all the photographers sort of fled um and i sort of stood up against the the concrete wall as just it it was out of one of those medieval um you know with the arrows <laughs> over, the, over yeah. the like um in the sky just i swear the sky like darkened um <laughs> the amount of beer and Ugh. i mean fortunately it was all plastic right so it was like nobody was gonna right. get hurt but it was just right. hundreds there is it is raining beer raining <laughs> beer um and they definitely cut away to commercial or something as it were right so they finally stopped throwing their i guess they ran out of stuff to throw um and so part of my job was then to go onto the field and sweep away as much product as i could um from like away from uh so they could actually do the penalty and continue the game and so then I had to take the train home with all my coworkers who were not in that situation. Uh, and they were like, you smell like you have had a really good time. And I'm like, no, I'm very sober. <laughs> this yeah. is, I am just really disgusting right now. So yeah. that was one of my most memorable moments. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Uh, if you could switch roles with any athlete for a day, who would it be and why? A retired one. 100%. I, I've i had the great fortune of knowing a lot of former women's professional soccer players um, and national team players. And their lives are so hard. Um, and I mean, some of them made like really good money. Um, yeah. So it's not even like a money thing. It's uh, the amount of stress that they you know, and they had to work out like all the time. And, but like, it really was the T it was the uncertainty. They like never knew. Yeah. It was like, Oh, well we have a new coach and that, you know, I mean, I remember one of my friends got traded. God, I didn't even think I said goodbye. Like, I think it was just like that morning found out, Oh no, she's off to another city. <laughs> what? That's insane. Like, yeah. okay, well have a nice life. Hopefully we see each other again sometime. <laughs> 
Um, so I've decided that, yeah, retired athlete, man. They, okay. If they made enough money in their career, oh, that's great. That's a great life. That's If yeah. I could do... If I could not have the athlete life, but but just immediately become a retired athlete, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> All right, <laughs> definitely a different answer than most, but I love it. I love it. We can't all be the same. It's a great insight. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you can if you can live the benefits of the post athlete career, why not? I don't. I don't think people realize how psychologically difficult their careers are. Like yeah. it is brutal. Yeah, yeah, and you're you're not about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a professor. I like everything even keeled. There you go. In the mountains, not in the city. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, final question. Sports often brings together people together and creates unforgettable moments like the one you just shared with your beer shower. Uh, can you share a personal sport memory that left, left a lasting impact on you? Doesn't have to be one you work, maybe one you attended. As you mentioned earlier, you just got back from the World Cup. Uh, just curious, maybe one of those top sports moments for you. Oh, man. My, I would say my favorite moment working was uh, I coached this little like U10 team in New Jersey. And one of our girls just obsessed with soccer, obsessed. And she was pretty small for her age. Um, so she's, you know... It, youth soccer in America is not the most technical, certainly not back then. Um, and so she was, you know, I think getting discouraged and, um, she came to one of the sky blue games and Heather O'Reilly was on our team at the time. And she's, she's pretty small herself. I think she's maybe five, five at best. Um, and it was really cool. I brought this girl down, uh, to the field and she got to meet Heather. And it was just kind of this moment where, you you just you watch a kid's face light up and they have yep. that experience yeah um and heather's amazing amazing person i knew it was a good choice in terms of the player because she's just <laughs> a fantastic human sure. um and so she was so good with her and uh yeah it was really cool and that girl still plays i mean she she played division one she's gosh 24 now which makes me feel old but um yeah it was pretty cool to be able to give that experience to be able to be the person who's like you know what I think I know what you need. Yeah. Let's bring you down the field and hopefully this will inspire you to keep playing. Love it. Just it's a, a full tiny. circle. That's yeah. It's those tiny little moments that make sports amazing. Absolutely. And just a full circle to relate it back to your story and the professor that told you that you needed to get your doctorate. You invested in this girl. She may not have thought it, but you knew what she needed. And you both you both won in the end. You getting your doctorate, her continuing in soccer. So Full circle mentor moment. I love that. <laughs> well, Natalie, thank you so much uh, for sharing a little bit about your journey, some insight, some fun questions at the end. And I very much appreciate you being a part of the podcast. Oh, it was great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching another episode of the Suits in the Stadium podcast. You can still find the audio version of our podcast wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and many more. New this season, you can find the video version of our podcast on our YouTube channel. Please make sure if you haven't already to follow us across social media platforms, including LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. We release new episodes every Monday, so make sure you subscribe so you never miss a single episode. Thanks so much, and we'll see you in the next one.